Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Rob. This is Eugene, and we're developers on the GeoTrails project. Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, this room is huge. It's pretty awesome. This, uh, this background is pretty, pretty cool. It looks like a giant raster. And uh, Eugene will be talking later about raster reprojection. So this looks like it's huh. reprojected in a weird, uh, weird projection. Anyway, so GeoTrellis is a scholar library for doing uh, geospatial applications. Uh, we pro provide core data types, such as um, some vector data types. Uh, but our main focus is on raster and raster operations. Uh, so along with being a uh, framework for doing, uh, for providing geospatial data types, we're a framework for performing distributed raster operations on top of ACA and Spark. And we've historically been on top of ACA with sort of a roll your own um, distribution mechanism. Uh, and then at some point, we d made the choice to, to move to Spark. And so a little history, uh, that was, the choice was in 2013, put out a mailing list uh, post about uh, moving the framework to Spark. Uh, Amit Kinney from Digital Globe began work uh, on GeoTrail Spark in November of uh, 2013. And then back in June, I actually did a talk at the Spark Summit um, uh, on, on our work. And I gave some benchmarks that kind of looked like this, right? So there's a MapReduce uh, framework for doing raster processing that exists. It's actually open source now. Um, and we gave some, uh, gave some numbers about how we were be uh, beating this uh, Hadoop-based, MapReduce-based map raster processing framework uh, on some simple operations. And since then, uh, actually, Amit had left Digital Globe, but we continued working on uh, the Spark support. Um, in April, we announced that uh, we want a grant from uh, the Department of Energy to work with climate data at scale. So there's a climate data set called the NASA Next Downsampled Climate Data Set that is uh, on S3. It's on an S3 bucket. It's about 17 terabytes of uh, compressed net CDF data, just raster data. Um, and then in August, we, did it, we merged a pull request for adding initial cumulative support uh, to GeoTrail Spark. And then so right now, we've been optimizing that uh, accumulative support and running uh, large-scale um, raster operations on um, clusters on EC2 and doing some benchmarking. Uh, so I'll let Eugene take over with uh, some more technical details. Uh, all right. Uh, hello, everybody. So Spark is a pretty awesome way to express complex transformations. And uh, we want to take that and say, yeah, OK, uh, but on geospatial. So I bet you not all of you are GIS people. So what is a raster? Raster is essentially an image that has a spatial extent. And uh, consequently, every pixel of that image covers a smaller area and contains some information about it. If it's a satellite image, uh, it could be just color or like infrared, infrared reflectance. Or it could actually be information like a population density, elevation, temperature. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to perform operations on these images that take some advantage of um, the spatial nature of this information. And as rasters get pretty big, uh, it's pretty convenient to tile them out. So uh, a tiled out uh, collection of tiles that has uh, some indexing, some sort of uh, tiling scheme and some metadata, uh, pretty much describes what we want to have for a distributed raster. So we have wrap an RDD of a K in a tile and at the metadata. And that's our base data type. Uh, we're pretty flexible about what the key is. Uh, obvious choices are the spatial, where you just have the column in the row. If there's time, of course, it can be a space, you know, spatial temporal. That's a big word. Anyway, so what can we do with that? What can we do with this uh, collection of uh, tiles? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through some uh, use cases from the beginning. And then we're going to get uh, to see why we care a lot about persistence and accumulo and what that gives us for our purposes. So use case one, there are tiles or geotiffs, which are rasters on S3. Uh, this is actually part of our climate work. Uh, there are tiles from climate models uh, for monthly intervals uh, for the next 100 years covering US. Pretty cool. Uh, not useful format. We can read them in, and they're certainly tiled out. Uh, but the tiling scheme doesn't mean much of anything. It's just where the border fell. And uh, they're probably not on the right projection. And projection essentially is a projection from a sphere onto a plane of a map. Um, the rule is it's never the one you want. So we need to reproject them. And what that's going to do is going to change the projection and it's going to warp the tiles, destroying whatever tiling scheme we had. 
And uh, now we're actually in deeper trouble. Uh, we don't even have a tiling system, so we need to find out what our overall extent is. Um, yeah, that sounds like a MapReduce job. We can just extract some metadata from each individual reprojected tile and MapReduce. Uh, we can handle that in Spark, yeah. Uh, map, reduce, at each stage, uh, we take the extents, we take the resolution, uh, the type of the rasters, and sort of go forward collecting uh, the raster metadata. And that gives us the first half of what we need for our data type. Then, we know how big our raster is, we have to pick uh, the destination tile layout. And we might as well pick a, a TMS layout because that's what you need to render this stuff on a leaflet. Uh, you need the X, the Y, and the zoom. Uh, each zoom level actually implies a resolution for the whole world because you know how big, big your tile is. So we're going to pick uh, the closest uh, level and we're going to project our tile into that, or rather, we're going to merge our tile into that. Um, it might shrink it a little or might uh, stretch it out a little bit, but uh, we'll see. So how can we express that? If we kind of squint and say, yeah, that's the tile layout we want, uh, each uh, target grid might actually overlap several of our initial tiles. We just need to pick out those little pieces. Uh, we can do that. Uh, we can't really go from something we don't have, so let's rephrase it. Uh, let's say each uh, projected tile we have, we can intersect with the destination grid and say it contributes to all of those tiles in the layout. And we can flat map on that. And now we have a non-unique um, collection, or rather a collection with non-unique keys. But whatever records share those keys, we know are part of that tile. So we can just reduce down by key and burn the part of the tile that intersects into the destination tile of our target grid. Uh, how does this actually look like in Spark? Uh, pretty good. This is the first part, right? So let's see, I can see that code that well, but I can see it there. Uh, so what can we tell from that? Uh, our input is RDD of T tile. We don't know what T is. The only thing we can get from it is an extent, so it's pretty generic. Uh, there is the flat map we talked about. Uh, a little bit down, we're using our metadata uh, to get the list of intersecting tile coordinates. Then we update the incoming key with the spatial component that we computed, and uh, yeah, that gives us the list. Now we just need to burn them, and yeah, that's the combined by key. We can define our combiners uh, that use our data types. And uh, go all the way to the bottom, bam, we got a raster RDD. Uh, so that's not exactly a trivial operation when you consider that all of those styles could have been uh, weird sizes, uh, actually not the same resolution, uh, not the same areas. Uh, we just sort of created a cohesive map of uh, possibly the whole world uh, in, what, two slides. And that's actual code. So we have this collection. We can persist it. And we used to persist it in HDFS. And uh, that's pretty good, because we can dump a lot of data into HDFS. And our distribution is great. And you know, uh, we get good throughput. Uh, but if we want to start looking at the subset of our data set, uh, we really don't have a great uh, tool for doing that. As a matter of fact, I don't think we have any. And we tried to hack one out. And uh, can we reason about what's the distribution of the tiles as they come out of the HDFS? You know, what the sequence of keys are going to come out on each particular machine? No, we can't. That's, that's hidden away from us. So it sounds like what we want is an index on top of HDFS uh, that allows us to reason about those things. And that's how I describe Akimbo. It's an index on top of HDFS. Uh, it's a big table clone, a columnar database, and it actually stores the records uh, in HDFS. Its architecture uh, mirrors that of uh, HDFS, and you can see the tablet servers are the parts that are responsible for serving out the index are actually, well, should be co-located with uh, your data nodes. Uh, this is uh, the key value format of uh, Accumulo, and it kind of has the same behavior of um, other key value stores, as in if uh, the key is non-unique within those parameters, um, it's going to blow away whatever is there. So what can we do with this key value store that we'll need? Uh, we can do row ID queries. So we can ask for row 1 to 1,000, 2,000 to 3,000, 5,000 to 7,000, all in one go. Uh, that's going to be useful. Uh, another thing we can do is uh, have access to server-side iterators. And uh, to be clear, those are the iterators that will run on Accumula on the server-side before the data leaves the socket. So um, 
We can implement our own. The interface is not that complex. Uh, but to start with, we have a good selection of filters, transforms, and combined iterators. So essentially, what we can do, and what almost everybody does, is have a rough shape of the query by providing the row IDs uh, that we need, and then using the server-side iterators to trim it down to the exactly the shape that we need. Uh, we also have locality groups, and uh, you can use the timestamp uh, to version. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, we don't need that, but I think that's cool. All right, so uh, what are the interfaces into this? Uh, it's in Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, so you have the input format, and you'll have the output format. And it does exactly what you would expect. Uh, you trade a list of uh, row ranges you want, the configuration for the iterators, for an RDD of key value. And then it's up to you to decode the key value into your own data types. That can be a simple map. Uh, on the way out, uh, you need an RDD of uh, text mutation. And mutation is a kind of optimization. It's all the changes that go into one particular row. Um, that kind of forms an atomic unit. can be additions as well as subtractions. And the text is actually a destination table, so you can be writing to multiple tables at the same time. All right. Uh, interestingly enough, there is actually a file output format which will uh, dump this out to HDFS, and that you can ask Accumula to import it in afterwards, and that turns uh, the ingest into an async job. It actually has better throughput, but the async nature of it can be uh, sometimes troubling. All right, so uh, we have this index, we have this tool. What properties did we actually care about? Well, to start off, we had that as a distribution. Uh, do we still have it with the Accumula with its uh, lexicographically sorted index? And uh, yeah, we do. Uh, the way it handles that uh, problem is that it uh, segments the table into a sequence of tablets. Uh, this is out of their user documentation, so. <laughs> but yeah, it segments the table out of their tablets, and it assigns each particular tablet uh, to a tablet server, and then it's the responsibility of the server to serve out queries uh, to that chunk of the index. Um, if the server goes down, uh, that's cool. That is actually an HDFS, so the master can reassign the tablet to a different server uh, that's going to uh, take over the job. And conversely, if you add a, uh, another uh, worker to your cluster, uh, then it's just going to rebalance the tablets to make the distribution pretty even. Um, yeah, so that checks out. Uh, the next property is uh, a little esoteric. I think we came up with the term, but it's a pretty simple term. And it's data alignment. Uh, so imagine you're doing a local operation. And uh, what a local operation is, is uh, you have two map layers, and you want to line them up and sort of do an operation just between the matching pixels. So if you wanted to find the output pixel for uh, this operation 2.2, all you'd need to do is look at the input tile with the index 2.2, you know, column 2, row 2, a uh, corresponding tile on the other layer, and just sort of ch go through them uh, pixel by pixel, and that's your output. Uh, the really uh, cool part about this is that if those tiles happen to be on the same machine, uh, there is no reason you would ever need to shuffle. Those tiles have all the information you need. And uh, local operations are actually bread and butter, I think, of JIS analysis. Well, anyway, useful. Uh, so how can we represent that? Let's say the red is uh, the first row, yellow is the second row, the green is uh, the second uh, Well, yeah, three rows, uh, three colors. Uh, so RDD2 is not aligned, RDD1 and 3 are aligned. Is there a tool in Accumulo that can help us uh, reason about that? Yeah, and actually it exists in all big table clones, and it's uh, all big table clones, and it's the row boundary guarantee. Um, if the columns have the same key, they are guaranteed to be stored on the same machine. Well, the same key in the same table, that's the important part. So the really cool side effect of this, if you materialize an RDD from uh, the first column family, the RCP26, and uh, it hangs out there, and then at some point later, you materialize uh, a second RDD from RCP60, uh, they're actually extremely likely verging and guaranteed to be aligned. So you can perform this local operation and incur no shuffle. All right. Uh, next property we can talk about is uh, clustering. And uh, clustering you can read about in... Uh, uh, database papers, and generally when people say clustering, they mean we don't want to do random access, uh, we can read a page at a time pretty much for free, so let's just make sure that whatever is on one page is going to be useful for us to work together. Uh, we can exploit the concept of locality group to approximate that. Uh, so for instance, uh, we noticed that a lot of the time we need to reduce through time. 
So it makes sense for us to store tiles for the same year in the same locality group and then just break out the year into the row ID. And that kind of also defines a granulity to amortize all the effort of indexing and distribution. Uh, there is a second version of clustering if you think about the row IDs themselves. And what it's useful for is um, focal operation. So a focal operation um, is when the output pixel actually depends on the values and the function on some neighborhood around it. Sounds good, but if you've tiled your image, that neighborhood can overlap uh, the tile boundary. So, yeah, that sounds like a shuffle. Can you minimize that? Well, if uh, the images happen to be on the same partition, that's not gonna be so bad because you don't have to cross the network, right? So, uh, I mean, I've been kind of waving my hands and saying, yeah, so we restore the row IDs, uh, but if you just did them as you did in the first, uh, as I did in the first column, just storing them as text, um, you would end up doing a row major uh, order. So first you would store the first row, then the second row, that's what lexicographic order is. So when you start to, to talk about what is the correct way to traverse um, a space, a two-dimensional, three-dimensional space, you come across the idea of a space filling curve. And the row ID on the right is generated using a z-order curve on two dimensions, on the column and the row values. And uh, that's what we're using, actually, right? So a space filling curve uh, maps an n-dimensional space uh, to one-dimensional ranges. Cool or rather uh, n-dimensional space to one-dimensional space. Uh, we also get a function that allows us uh, to take a hypercube, some subspace of that, so for example, uh, you know, spatial extent and temporal extent, and uh, decompose that into a set of uh, one-dimensional ranges. And uh, one-dimensional ranges is exactly, exactly what we have. Uh, we can throw that right against a cumulo and expect a response. And surprisingly, Accumulo is actually really great at taking a huge number of these ranges and uh, parsing it out and starting to give us a response quickly. Now, z-order curve probably is not the optimal uh, choice for this. I've been told that Hilbert curve has better locality. But the results from this actually are already not too bad. And you can see how the neighborhood is preserved if you follow the curve along. So if you take this advice and you actually implement this, uh, which people have done, including us, uh, you will find that uh, what the Cumulo input format does is it generates a split uh, for each one of the ranges. So a split from the Hadoop input format. And then split maps uh, to a Spark task, and you'll have tens of thousands of ranges. And some of them will not be that big, and that's gonna cause you bad time because uh, Spark will not parallelize. Well, we know that you know, the, the partitions need to be properly sized. What we'd like to do is actually have a split per tablet server because we said that's the unit of our distribution. That will parallelize well. Uh, we can do that uh, because Accumulo has a tablet locator that has this information, so we can merge these ranges together. Uh, we've done that. Um, unfortunately, uh, the tablet locator is a private API, so there is a link there of our implementation. We've tested it, it works really nice, huge improvement in performance. And we're working on a pull request uh, back to Accumula to add this optimization. All right, so we've gone through all this trouble of indexing our data. Uh, what can we do with it? So use case is time series, going back to climate data. We have the stack of rasters, and we really want to look at some area that perhaps overlaps uh, more than one tile. Uh, the first realization that we have is, okay, well, the tile layout matches, so we can match on that. But there is a bunch of tiles we never actually need to look at. So we can throw those out, never even load them. Um, and we use, uh, you know, the Z-curve decomposition for that. Then uh, perhaps we want to reduce uh, the granularity of time from monthly to annual, so take the average of the months to make the data a little less noisy. And then we want to summarize the area of the polygon. So we want to perhaps take the maximum. It could be a more complex operation. But let's say it's the maximum. And hopefully the output will be a series, you know, date and uh, maximum temperature. All right, this is actually that operation implemented in GeoTrellis. And um, again, uh, pretty readable. Uh, we see our data types. We start with a raster RDD with space-time key. We have some polygon. 
uh, we map the time component of our key back to the first of the year. So uh, everything in one year is going to share one date. Uh, we average down the keys that share uh, the same uh, spatial, or rather, that are now uh, duplicate. And then we perform our zonal summary. And uh, yeah, it works. Uh, we have uh, deployed it on uh, AWS, and we've benchmarked it. So the actual data set is uh, 75 uh, gigabytes. Uh, that's the data set name if uh, you're interested in it. And it goes out for 100 years. So yeah, so we can run it on Philadelphia. Um, that's not awesome. We kind of settle uh, right into doing it under a second, uh, right at what, four or five nodes, and then it's not going down that much. And that's kind of expected because uh, Philadelphia actually occupies a pretty small space um, in, uh, I guess, spatial temporal dimensions. So, or at least in spatial dimensions. So it's not getting distributed across the whole index. And that's a good thing. We don't want to spread such a small set across uh, too wide of a cluster and then shuffle it over the network for no reason. So perhaps that's as fast as we can uh, expect it to compute. Uh, we'll benchmark more to find out if that's actually the case. So let's look at a larger area. Let's look at East Kansas. Yeah, okay, that scales. Uh, we can uh, calculate uh, the separation for East Kansas uh, what, in about three and a half seconds uh, with eight nodes. Uh, that's pretty good. Let's go up uh, the Rockies and just sort of drawing a bounding box around the Rockies. Um, yeah, we can do it uh, in what? Uh, it looks like uh, 38 seconds uh, with eight nodes on AWS. And finally, USA. And also scales except for that weird bump. So what is that? That's about 170, no, I'm sorry, 150 seconds uh, to do this calculation for all of US at monthly interval for 100 years. Um, that's pretty good. And I'm gonna hand over to Rob to talk about uh, these benchmarks some more. Yeah, so now that I got the current slide right, uh, I was showing this slide where there's this ad rasters, there's the MapReduce solution um, we're doing this over, and like benchmark is, benchmarks are kind of hand wavy because they're hard to like compare, but this is a 100 gigabyte raster layers, so 200 gigabytes total over a three node cluster, and we're doing, on the MapReduce solution, we, it takes three hours to do a simple add, and uh, on the beginnings of our GeoTrawl Spark on HDFS, it's taking about 30 minutes. Um, right. So now we're do, we, we can do things like uh, do spatial temporal operations, which we weren't, weren't even possible without our, Z, uh, our space filling curve indexing and the ability to um, hit a cumulo with a set of small uh, one dimensional ranges and hydrate a RDD off of that. So an example that we could try to compare to is that uh, two layers, which are 75 gigabytes each uh, on five nodes, um, and each node has eight cores, which is similar to the uh, previous benchmark. And so we can do a local subtract operation and then find the min max of the whole entire layer, which is a, just a pretty simple map reduce operation. You map the min max from the tiles and then reduce that down. And we can do that now in 10 minutes. Um, and that's just to try to show you some progress that we've been making uh, since last Spark Summit. So hopefully we'll just continue optimizing this and uh, really pushing this forward. So thanks a lot. One question. I know what it's going to be. Yeah. Can you please go to a microphone? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's for. So, the what was the big uh, reason why you chose a Cumulo or HPS? Because maybe I'm not that familiar with the Cumulo, but HPS is widely supported, I think better supported in the Hadoop ecosystem. And we have HPS everywhere. I'm from Comcast. So what is the big reason why you chose Accumulo? Uh, that's a good question. So um, we are part of a, uh, uh, so part of the thing that happened between, I think, last Spark Summit and now, or maybe we were already submitted, but there's an uh, organization called Location Tech, uh, which is a working group inside of the Eclipse Foundation, which is supporting uh, open source projects that deal with geospatial. So there's a, there's a number of open source projects that deal with ge geospatial data and they're supported by Location Tech. We're in the incubation phase of that progress. 
um, there's a couple other projects that deal with big data in geospatial that are under location tech, two of which now uh, deal with Accumulo. So there was just a lot of knowledge about, um, about Accumulo at our fingertips with that resource. Um, they, actually, one of those projects, GeoWave, is on Accumulo, and they're actually working on a HBase, um, HBase uh, implementation right now. And I think that, so we're, we're on Accumulo right now. We actually have some work going to do a Cassandra backend. Uh, we want to support HBase. We want to support pulling directly from S3. Um, our I.O. code is pretty modular, so it's just a matter of uh, plugging in different backends to, um, to our code that supplies the raster RDD. Uh, we have a lot of modularized indexing code that kind of would help with building that stuff out. So I don't think an HBase uh, backend is, is too far away. All right, let's thank our speakers. Oh.